Alex. So that's youtube.com forward slash NTO TV. Uh, now, uh, Melissa Warner, who is the executive officer of Mind Medicine Australia and the co founder of Australian uh, Psychedelic Society. Um, and Melissa is. Uh, is hosting uh, Professor David Nutt in uh, Melbourne. And David Nutt uh, was uh, infamous for, in, I think it was 2010, uh, he was uh, the head of the UK government's advisory board uh, on drugs. And he made a uh, comparison uh, between ecstasy use and, and what he called equacy. He wrote a paper on it uh, and said that actually it's more dangerous to ride horses, equacy, uh, than it was to take ecstasy. He used the statistics, he, he demonstrated it. It was a bit facetious, but um, yeah, the government weren't happy with that. Um, he also said it was safer than alcohol, which is true. Um, they, if the facts didn't suit their political agenda, get rid of the facts. Funnily enough, if he was to say that this week, then he might get a slightly different, yeah. different <laughs> yeah, result. So. Uh, Melissa. Thank you, Nick, for that lovely introduction. And welcome, everyone. It's really nice to see so many people turn up for such an important topic that I'm sure is dear to all our hearts. So we're living... Thanks. We're living during very interesting times when it comes to our understanding of the mind and our awareness of how to grow it and change it and make it more healthy. Neuropharmacology, neuroimaging and psychology has revealed ways to understand the inner workings of the mind and to better navigate our course individually and perhaps collectively. Wisdom practices like meditation are becoming really commonplace, which I think is really uh, a good sign because meditation has been shown to increase compassion and emotional awareness in those who practice regularly. And psychedelics are no longer drugs. They are now medicines, which is something really profound. So we're at this time of innovation for the mind and, is, and a greater understanding of how to access what we previously could not access, the unconscious mind, and therefore ways to change our lived experience. So who here knows someone who's been affected by mental illness? Yeah, I imagine that really should be everyone because 45% of Australians will suffer from a mental illness in their lifetime, which is quite a staggering figure. And currently, one in five have a mental illness. And these statistics are generally rising. So we have this crux point of innovation and understanding, and yet quite a large problem to address. For many people, these experiences can come from the fact that our environments define our lived experience, our reality, our experiences, our storylines. And it can be quite hard to change our storylines. Aldous Huxley said in The Doors of Perception in the 1960s, I believe, that psychedelics were of the plane of art, perpetual creation, and that one day they may find a way out of mental illness for those suffering. And it looks like today that is a statement that is ringing true. Here's a picture of psychedelics on the Wall Street Journal recently, and this uh, phrase you may have heard, which is quite common now, of a psychedelic renaissance, science renaissance. And there's a lot of research to back this up. Psychedelics have been found useful in the treatment of end-of-life anxiety, which is a trial that PRISM is leading at St. Vincent's, also to treat addiction, treatment-resistant depression, and MDMA has reliably been shown to relieve PTSD in sufferers, a treatment that is, not uh, is notoriously difficult to treat PTSD because the window of tolerance for a trauma where you're reactive is so narrow. So this is really profound. I like to use the analogy that psychedelics may allow us to turn off the autopilot in our programs and our learned behaviors. There we go. But what's next? Really, a lot has happened. We have our first psychedelic science trial in Australia. But in terms of 
treatment and therapy, we really are still at the beginning. Currently, medications that are prescribed generally have to be taken every single day and have an efficacy of a range between 20 to 40 percent. Which is very different from psychedelics, which generally relieve the treatment in one to two doses. I'm just going to skip a few slides here. And this is why My Medicine Australia has been born. We're a nexus between academia, government, clinicians, and culture to translate these clinical findings into therapeutic practices and outcomes, which is a really exciting thing to be doing. I think it's something that's really relevant for anyone who attends transformative festivals or has transformative experiences to know the value of context, of set and setting, of how to think about psychedelics in the context of, of your life. And that's why we'll be launching on the 13th of February at University of Melbourne and I'd be really happy to see some of these faces along there. David Nutt, I, I, if you liked that one-liner about MDMA being as safe as riding a horse. Expect a few more. He's quite a funny guy, which is nice. And yeah, we're proud to be a funding partner with PRISM for the trial. And one of our missions is to create a therapist training program in years to come. And these therapists will be able to participate in trials, but also it's lined up to be released when MDMA will become a medicine in the USA. So hopefully we'll be able to train some therapists up in line with that. What I think is really important that becomes clear when you look at the research behind psychedelics is the importance of context, the importance of the environment, the way you think about your experience. Because just as much as a psychedelic can be therapeutic, it can hinder you in the wrong environment, in the wrong set and setting. I find it quite interesting to think about how if we look past this last century, psychedelic use quite likely went right back to ancient Greece, 430 BC, in what was called the Elysian Mysteries, where the scholars, leaders, and artists of ancient Greece would meet and go through a seven-day ritual ceremony, which culminated with what we th is likely to be a chemical that is similar to LSD, derived from w wheat? Was it wheat? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so that's quite interesting. It's quite a long heritage this culture has. And I think that spaces like Rainbow Serpent, like Burning Man, are a sort of a, a very early stage attempt to create spaces where people can come and have safe uh, experiences. I'd, Cicero described, he was a Roman senator, he described the Eltonian Mysteries as the civilizing aspect of ancient Greek culture. I'm not sure if we can yet describe, as much as I love Rainbow Serpent, I come, I've been coming for five years straight, I'm not sure if we can quite call these experiences a sibling aspect of our culture yet, yet. which is why I think, <laughs> perhaps uh, to some degree, but I think that's why it's really important to think about how, as members of this culture that has this long lineage, how are we representing these profound compounds? Robin Carhart Harris of the Imperial College research team published a paper last year that was titled The Importance of Context in the Psychedelic Experience. And he described how those who are currently using psychedelics have a certain responsibility in this transition, as, we, as Martin spoke about, as we move psychedelics away from the label of drug, away from the label of 
technically in Australia, Schedule 9 is a poison to medicine. How do we show up to that title, to that responsibility? I've been a rule breaker a number of times in my life. And from those experiences, I've learnt that there comes a responsibility of being a rule breaker. And that is, you have to be comfortable with everyone else breaking the rules the way you do. You have to break the rules as if they didn't need to be there in the first place. So, with that in mind, I guess, how can we spread that message to the other participants here, to the newcomers? What questions can we ask our friends when they take a psychedelic? What intentions have they set? What goals will they be aiming to reach from the realizations that they have during their experience? If you're going to be having a transformative experience at this festival at some point, I ask you to share your intentions with your friends and those around you. Just a plug for the event. And I think this is important because to help society reconsider their relationship, its relationship with psychedelics, we have to be the exemplars of our own relationship with psychedelics and be the leading example of what that can mean, what that can look like. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. We've got a few questions that have uh, floated up here. If you did have a question, uh, there is still some pen and paper. If you put your hand up, maybe the pen and paper will come to you. Uh, and I've got a few here. I uh, just wanted to say again for anyone that's come along and is wondering what's going on, uh, we're the Australian Psychedelic Society. We have a stall uh, in the uh, market space area, in the middle somewhere, um, along with Students for Sensible Drug Policy who are running their uh, Be Heard Not Harmed campaign uh, to get pill testing, uh, not to be such an oppositional thing and just to be a sensible harm reduction strategy that gets implemented. Uh, there's a petition there that you can have a look at. There's some books there. and. Um, and sitting next to me is Martin Williams, the president of Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine, PRISM. And you just heard from Melissa Warner from Mind uh, Medicine Australia. Um, bunch of websites. I'm not going to read them all out for you. If you want to find the websites, um, they are at, again, flyers at the stall. Uh, so if you're interested, go pick them up. There's also people there. If you have uh, other, other things that you want to talk about, uh, we're always up for a chat. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, was there one that you were particularly interested in? They just go from the top. Yep, from the top. Yeah. Okay, so this question uh, for both of you. As someone who is taking an SSRI for severe anxiety, do you foresee any chances in the future of psilocybin, uh, psilocybin being used to treat sufferers of this or the clinical tri trials being used uh, mainly for terminal ill patients at the moment? Do you want to touch that? Or? We, can, we both can. Yeah. There's definitely an interest in creating a trial for treatment-resistant depression or just depression. There is phase two trials happening currently in the US and through Europe for phase two treating depression with psilocybin. So it's definitely something we'd love to create. I guess it's a matter of a limitation of funding. So, yeah. and with the SSRI, I think Martin can yeah, sure. So, uh, I think the key the key um, factor here is that, as uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, SSRIs are, are taken daily for an extended period of time. Sometimes, in some cases, for intractable anxiety or depression for um, for the rest of one's life, um, and that's really the huge contrast with psychedelic therapy, which is um, more often than not a single administration or maybe two. Uh, in the context of psychotherapy. And the, the, the benefits really accrue. They, um, they come very quickly and they, they uh, have been found to, to last six months or longer in, in the ma significant majority of cases. Um, as far as anxiety itself is concerned, that's really going to be interesting to, to explore because um, anxiety and depression can be very closely correlated, of course, but they can also be somewhat, somewhat separate uh, conditions. And so anxiolytic therapy is, is, is one of the options which unfortunately has attendant um, uh, side effects and the, the concern about um, tolerance and eventual habituation or dependence. Um, 
Interestingly enough, psilocybin has been used successfully uh, in trials to treat OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder, which is considered to be something of an anxiety related disorder, I believe. Um, and then another one which is, uh, has been um, mentioned to me recently is the potential um, of psilocybin for treatment of, um, of uh, eating disorders as well, which are also considered to be very deep-seated anxiety-related disorders. So I personally would, would really love to see um, research uh, take place in Australia. We potentially could lead the world in this because it's, it's actually a research space that hasn't been explored to any great degree elsewhere. And so I feel that if we can um, if we can really get things rolling successfully with this initial trial, um, then further trials are going to be, be made much more um, straightforward and accessible. Um, I think we'll have increasing interest from funding partners as well as from uh, researchers in the space uh, and specialist researchers in these particular subfields of mental health. Um, and so I would, uh, I would encourage all of you to participate in the conversation, contribute to the conversation with people you may know in the mental health space. Um, and then perhaps between us, we can, we can all bring things forward fairly quickly. What I can say is that um, the, the dam wall appears to be sort of bursting a little bit and there does appear to be some interest already um, in, um, in researching psilocybin for other, uh, other mental health conditions already. Uh, specifically major depressive disorder or straight depression. Um, and so at this end, um, there's another one which I can't tell you about at the moment. But um, there's, uh, there's certainly potential. I feel there's great interest already in the field. Uh, I'm very happy to say that I think we've, we've started to really tread the path and, and that will make it much more straightforward for others to enter the field. Um, and what I can also say is that PRISM is in no way trying to be um, proprietorial or, or dominate or yeah, dominate the space. So um, we feel that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a significant first step taken and we encourage all people to participate in, in research in Australia. Um, staying on psilocybin research, someone is interested in the uh, protocol used around the research. Is that even outlaid yet? Or? I, can, I can give it to you in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, Basically, uh, as many of you may already be aware, very critical to the success of psychedelic psychotherapy are the, are the, pre -ste the steps of, um, of preparatory therapy, which normally in our case would be a couple of sessions, uh, fairly extended sessions between the participant or the patient um, and the clinicians, um, to basically to set the scene for the, for the therapeutic process. Um, most of these people, uh, particularly people who are um, at end of life um, through terminal illness, um, uh, probably will not be experienced in psychedelic use and so they will need to be informed of, um, of, the, poten of the potential effects, um, potential uh, side effects and adverse effects which generally would include um, some anxiety as the, as the experience is starting and unfolding but then generally that will be resolved. If, it's, um, if it turns out to be anxiety or any other mental health difficulties that cannot be resolved then um, it's possible to use rescue medications but that's generally not preferred. Um, but all of these would be explained to the participant in, that, in those preparatory sessions. And the importance of these preparatory, preparatory sessions is also to, est to establish um, the therapeutic alliance between the um, between the participant and the and the clinical team. In all cases, we'll have a male-female dyad team, and there will always be they'll always be trained clinical psychologists and or psychiatrists. Um, in each case, we will need to have a qualified medical practitioner who is able to um, uh, actually um, prescribe formally prescribe and administer the drug. Then the, um, the active uh, compound, the psilocybin or placebo session would take place. Um, it would be a full day session starting at eight in the morning and would go through till perhaps um, between four and six in the afternoon. Um, and that would be a, a, a sort of a, a gently guided psychotherapy session. So that it's really the participant doing the, doing the healing uh, once uh, themselves, him or herself. Um, there would be music um, through, There'll be music through um, headphones. There are a couple of interesting enhancements that we're hoping to, to bring into our clinical trial, which will be very interesting in terms of the music selection and so on. 
Um, and uh, there'd be normally eye shades so that people who are having strongly visual experiences will, can go through those um, without major distractions. And then, of course, you may be aware that um, equally important are the integrative sessions which would take place after the active session. And those would be, again, discussions between the participant and the therapists to go through the, um, the individual's experience and then to try and put those in within the context of their own um, broader experience and uh, hopefully achieve the lasting therapeutic outcomes. So that's sort of the it in a nutshell. Um, we, it, ours is a, um, it's a placebo-controlled, randomised controlled trial with a crossover design, which means that half of our 30 participants will um, receive uh, a placebo of niacin or nicotinic acid, same compound, which basically gives quite a sort of a flush to the face and makes people feel that something might be going on, but it doesn't obviously have the psychoactive effects of psilocybin. Um, and then the other half would, would uh, receive 25 milligrams, which is a, a, pretty, a pretty solid dose of, of psilocybin. Um, so they're more or less guaranteed to have a significant psychedelic experience. Um, and then at a, a point normally around six weeks after that initial session of psilocybin placebo, then there's the crossover so that those people who receive the placebo the first time will receive the psilocybin the second time. They and the therapists won't be aware whether they've had one or the other. And those who received the psilocybin the first time will get the placebo the second time. And that's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky, uh, slightly tricky aspect of the trial, but it's really um, very important for us to do it that way for the integrity of the research. And uh, 25 milligrams of psilocybin, what does that equate to in grams? Is it around four? It's probably three and, a, three and a half to four grams dried of uh, sub, uh, local subaeruginosa. I'm going to uh, combine two questions here because there's a few uh, few people that have asked a similar question, but I suppose it's the other side of the research question. It's the uh, the money side. Uh, the question: uh, How do we stop big pharma corrupting psychedelic research? And I'll uh, put this one in here too. Uh, going back to the synthetic thing that we talked about before, synthetic psilocybin. Uh, somebody's asking: uh, Is this is this a bad thing or a good thing in terms of patenting and the way that um, uh, medicine uh, medicines can be controlled by business? Uh, so thoughts. You don't. This is a this is a big topic. It's a topic that's only starting to uh, to, to balloon recently. I'm, I'm champing at the bit with this one. Um, the best way we can keep big pharma out is to demonstrate that psilocybin is the best, most efficacious uh, psychedelic for this, and to um, basically to um, to suggest that analogs or other psychedelic compounds that could be um, could be created or um, synthesized, invented by pharmaceutical companies um, are not as efficacious in the treatment of these mental health conditions. Because psilocybin is a, it is a, it's a natural product, it's derived from a, from a, a, a mycological source, fungal source, um, it can't actually be patented. What can be patented, however, by a company, um, and it's generally not going to be big pharma for a reason that I'll explain in just a moment, um, the, the, uh, if there's a novel, a new method of synthesis um, which makes um, the production of psilocybin cheaper or more effective or more efficient, then that process can be patented, but that doesn't exclude at other companies, including non-profits, from, um, from developing other synthetic techniques. So it's really just protection for the synthetic process at this stage. If the laws finally change so that natural product psilocybin could be used, then there's absolutely no way that that, um, that could um, be protected through the IP system. Now, the reason that I alluded to about Big Pharma not being interested, and this is pretty much the same case for MDMA, um, in fact, almost any psychedelic psychotherapy, um, is that because psychedelic psychotherapy has been shown to be efficacious after only one, two, or maybe three administrations. This is really not at all um, in, uh, of interest to the big pharmaceutical model, uh, commercial model. Their interest is actually in promoting the daily use of antipsychotics, uh, antidepressants, anxiolytics, um, so that they can keep charging the generally the public health system, but often um, the private health systems as well, um, to just keep on dispensing drugs. So I would, I would put it to you that um, developing, exploring and developing psychedelic psychotherapies is probably the best way to keep Big Pharma in check as it happens. And that's also why it's difficult to bring psychedelic medicines to market because there isn't that Big Pharma push. It's a much slower process, which is okay. It's probably better to have them out than, than in. 
one thing I can say is that to bring for a for a for Merck or Glaxo, GSK or one of the global Nevada so whoever one of the big um, uh, pharmaceutical companies to bring a totally novel drug to market, um, and this must uh, I have to say this includes the um, the very preliminary costs of identifying a target developing the very early, very small molecules which then can be developed into more effective larger molecules which eventually can be turned into drugs. And then, usually this will include the attrition of hundreds if not thousands of other candidate compounds and then eventually involve the marketing, global marketing effort um, for each of the, um, the markets for which a drug is to be um, developed or sorry, commercialised is in the order of 800,000 to 1 billion US dollars. So these are the realities. This is what a pharmaceutical company budgets to bring a new drug to market. We're talking, when we're talking about psychedelic uh, psychotherapy, we're talking very, very small beer by comparison, okay? So just to give you an idea, we're looking at probably in the order of 200 to $500,000 absolute tops to go through all of the um, clinical phase two and three process to bring something like psilocybin to, to market. So. Those are the kind of numbers we are talking about. That's the grim reality that we're living in. Uh, switching to a slightly... Yeah, yep, yep. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, but a question here. Uh, has there been any research done on derealization disorder? And I haven't heard of this, so maybe you could talk about what... Is there a derealization disorder? And can you talk, talk a bit about it? And what would you recommend as a treatment? There hasn't been any research into psychedelics to treat de depersonalization or derealization disorder. I imagine that would be a, 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 difficult, a difficult one and probably might require perhaps even a longer treatment regime. Would you say so, Martin? Yeah, um, one thing I can say is that in general, unfortunately at this stage in clinical research, um, there's a range of um, of broader psychotic, um, psychotic related disorders and also borderline personality and a couple of these other depersonalization type disorders. Um, and uh, yeah, with, yeah, sorry, with depersonalization, which are um, explicitly excluded from trials. At this stage, they tend to be just too difficult cases, cases which are too difficult to manage in the therapeutic context. Um, and the likelihood is that the um, the results will be confounded by that underlying mental health condition. So unfortunately at this stage there's, there's not much we can do. So I'm, I'm sorry on behalf of the research community about that. And that's uh, not fun. to say that, that there might be some positive effect, it's just to say that it's a difficult one to study. So that will come later. Final question and um, it's, it's important, it's probably a good one to finish on because it's important for everybody. There, there is a lot of excitement over all of this and uh, uh, often I see online, and spend far too much time looking at these social media comment threads, uh, but a lot of people will be recommending to their friends or to somebody, some random stranger on the internet, oh, take this for, you know, you've, you've got d depression, just go take some mushrooms. So the question is, um, what sort of risk is attached to uh, recommending uh, self-trials to other people uh, side effects uh, related to other mental health conditions that they might have. Like, is it a good idea? Uh, what, should, what should people be doing if, if a friend's asking uh, to be pointed in a right direction, I guess? Well, I think a, a first point is if somebody has a mental health condition, they should be seeing, or well, it's ideal to be seeing a psychologist or a psychotherapist regularly. I, I don't think that friends um, even well-meaning friends should act as a primary caregiver in these circumstances. And there are psychologists who are open to discussing concepts about around preparation and integration. Obviously, they can't give psychedelic therapy, but there are quite a few psychologists out there willing to do the aftermath talks and the preparation talks. So seeking out somebody who, with an open mind, if, you're, if this person's going to be doing it anyway, something to consider um, but it is that's a tricky one yeah and always needs caution yeah and and, and certainly that uh, that the um, the comorbid risks of um, as I mentioned before psychotic um, type mental health um, conditions um, potentially could be exacerbated 
by by the use of psychedelics, even just a single single experience. So um, I don't know who or how many people in this audience might have had contact with people who have had very difficult um, experiences that have led to ongoing mental health conditions. But um, anybody who ha who has, um, I'm sure they'd agree with me that. Um, that it's generally a situation that we would prefer to avoid. And so this is really the reason that, um, that careful screening and at least awareness on the part of, of potential um, self-medicators uh, self um, of the risks um, of underlying mental health conditions should be taken into account. Again, we have a stall uh, in the market area where you can go and continue having conversations with people from APS and from SSDP about their campaign, Be Heard Not Harmed. Uh, you can also hear more about that campaign tomorrow, uh, about this time in the cocoon, I think from 3.45, so a little bit earlier. Uh, uh, you've heard from Martin Williams from PRISM, Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine. Thank you. A round of applause. And Melissa Warner from Mind Medicine Australia who, again, are launching with an event with uh, Professor David Nutt on Wednesday, February 13th. Uh, it's in Melbourne at uh, the University of Melbourne, the Carrillo Gart uh, Ganta.